Well, I know I'm a little late to the party on this one, but what the hell. Let's talk about the live-action adaptation of Ghost in the Shell. The story for this movie focuses on Major Mira Killian, who has been transformed into the ultimate weapon, a fully synthetic body with a living brain inside and all of the latest cybernetic enhancements including a built-in cloaking device. She was chosen for this role after she was the sole survivor of a terrorist attack, though her real body was pretty much unusable. And now with her new synthetic body, she works for a task force known as Section 9, which is trying to stop a cyber terrorist known as Kuze. And over time, she starts having some strange hallucinations and becomes troubled with just how little she remembers of her past and starts to wonder who she really is. So I think damn near every fan of the original Ghost in the Shell movie was ready to hate this as soon as it was announced. Um, I wasn't expecting much either, to tell the truth. And of course, there was a huge casting controversy that did not help matters, and we'll get into that later. But I was still kind of looking forward to this in a way, because sometimes movies end up surprising me. I wasn't expecting much from Split. I ended up enjoying Split. I damn sure wasn't expecting much from The Great Wall, and I ended up really liking that. I wouldn't say it was a good movie, but I still enjoyed it. So, maybe I could end up enjoying Ghost in the Shell as well. And now that I've seen the movie... Eh. It's okay. As far as big budget action movies go... It's okay. I think its Rotten Tomatoes rating has been hovering around 50%, and that's about what it deserves, because it's... okay. Now, as an adaptation... Oh no, it's fucking terrible as an adaptation. The only time it remotely succeeds as an adaptation is when they are trying to visually recreate certain iconic moments from the original. And... In that respect, the movie does very well. There are a lot of familiar scenes in this movie, and they look fantastic. But in terms of story and themes and the various questions it asked about artificial intelligence and memories and humanity and just what it means to really be alive, didn't even try. Now, I will give them this much. Unlike Beauty and the Beast, they did at least try to do something different with the source material rather than just making a carbon copy of the original. And that's good. Or rather, it would have been good if the new direction they took it in amounted to anything, and it really didn't. All we ended up with was the big bad evil corporation lied to me. Gee, never heard that one before. The story is really the movie's biggest problem. It's just... Not all that interesting when you get down to it, and I probably should have guessed this would happen when I noticed Aaron Kruger was credited as a writer on this movie. If you don't know, he was a co-writer for several of the Transformers movies. And if that's not a red flag, I don't know what is. And the weird thing is, there were hints of something bigger. Like, there's this kind of a running theme where Scarlett Johansson's character is constantly asked for her consent for certain things. Like, my name is Major Mira Killian, and I give my consent. Like, anytime she needs to have some hallucinations wiped from her memory, she has to consent to that every time. And maybe this could have turned into some kind of a commentary on free will or something. I don't know. It really didn't turn into anything except the big bad evil corporation lied to me. That's it. There were times when they could have done something more with this story, but they just didn't try. And it's a shame the story drags the movie down so much because it does do a lot of things right. The acting is very good across the board. ScarJo was pretty good, all things considered, and we will get to those things to consider. I liked Pilo Asbake, I hope I'm saying his name right, as Bato, thought he was pretty good. Beat Takeshi as Chief Aramaki was Awesome. He plays the Section 9 authority figure very well and is clearly not a guy to be fucked with. He even gets a very brief action sequence of sorts. He doesn't have to do anything terribly physical, it's just a very quick shootout. But still, it's one of those moments where he just reminds the bad guys that he may be an old man, but he didn't get to be the soul by losing fights. And oddly enough, Aramaki is the only character in this movie who does not speak English. He speaks Japanese 
all the way through. But this movie follows the Star Wars rule where everyone is speaking to each other in different languages, yet somehow they can all understand each other. And that's fine, but my only complaint there is that I kind of wish they had done more with that. You know, if you really want to show how this futuristic version of Hong Kong has become this huge cultural melting pot, go all out with that. Have everybody speaking in different languages and yet they can somehow understand each other. Asbeck is, I think, Danish in real life. Have Bato speak Danish, why not? Juliette Binoche's character, have her speak French. Go all out with it, do something with it, please. As you might expect, this movie does have a fair amount of action and the action sequences are pretty good overall. They in some way kind of make up for the relatively uninteresting story. The visuals are incredible, which I suppose you would expect from a movie called Ghost in the Shell. So I suppose that's another aspect where it kind of lives up to the original. Although there are times when this futuristic Hong Kong looked strangely like a ghost town. Sometimes it does look like a big city with lots of people, lots of traffic and all that, but there are other moments where it just completely loses that. There's one scene in particular where Major and Bato are driving down the street and there is no traffic on the road at all, virtually no pedestrians that I can recall, and just, where the fuck is everybody? And visually, this city looks like Blade Runner on steroids. They got these huge 3D video advertisements up in the skyline, and down at street level, pretty much everything is lighting up and projecting holograms and just doing its best to annoy the shit out of you. Even the street itself lights up. And eventually I started thinking, you know what? It actually kind of makes sense that the city would be mostly empty because everyone got tired of being visually assaulted by all this shit and they packed up and fucking left. I think they went a little overboard with it is all I'm saying. Now, regarding the casting controversy with ScarJo as Major Mira Killian, replacing Major Motoko Kusanagi from the original in what seems to be yet another example of Hollywood whitewashing. How is this still a thing? And leading up to this movie's release, there were many people arguing both for and against the casting of ScarJo, and many people of Japanese descent on both sides of that argument. And oddly enough, one of the people in favor of her casting was Mamoru Oshii himself, the guy who directed the original Ghost in the Shell movie. He was all in favor of ScarJo playing the major, and his argument was... Motoko Kusanagi is not necessarily this character's real name. It's definitely not her original body. So really, there's no expectation that this character absolutely has to be Japanese. In a previous life, who knows? She may not have been. And you know what? He has a good point. Or at least he did until this movie's story shat all over that. And in order to explain this, I do have to get into spoiler territory, so you have been warned, if you don't want spoilers, stop the video. Five, four, three, two, one, here we go. So, as I mentioned earlier, the Big Bad Evil Corporation told Major Killian that her family was killed in a terrorist attack and she was the only survivor, and they took her existing brain and put it in a brand new body, turning her into the ultimate weapon. And as you might expect, the Big Bad Evil Corporation lied to her, because that's kind of what they do. And she was not the victim of a terrorist attack. She was actually a runaway and was taken off the street by the Big Bad Evil Corporation because they figured, hey, she's a runaway, won't be missed. And here's the kicker. In that previous life, as a runaway, she was in fact a Japanese girl named Motoko Kusanagi. So in this movie's universe, that was in fact her original name and body. And when the Big Bad Evil Corporation got a hold of her, they turned her into the perfect weapon, and apparently their idea of perfection happens to be a white lady. And the implications of that are not good. Now, all that being said, there is maybe, maybe, mind you, a way that they could have salvaged this, at least partially. They could have potentially made this part of the story and emphasize that by changing her race and her nationality and her heritage, just completely altering her entire backstory like this, they stole a huge part of her identity. 
and then have Major ask herself, even as her original memories start to return, is she really still that same person? Can she still call herself Motoko Kusanagi? Can she still call herself Japanese? Is that part of her completely gone? Or then again, does it really matter? Is all that really what makes her who she is? Or is it more her feelings, her emotions, her memories? What exactly is it that makes her her? Is it more what's on the inside than on the outside? More her present rather than her past? So many questions they could have asked here. But once again, they didn't even fucking try. Because all of this amounts to absolutely nothing except the big bad evil corporation lied to me. That's it. Hey, you see that thing out there on the water? That huge thing that's moving away from us? That's the boat. And you missed it. And the really weird thing is Motoko's mother actually set up a gravesite for her daughter, assuming she was dead. And technically, I guess she was, briefly. She got better. But... On her tombstone is her romanized name. It's not written in any Japanese alphabet or anything. It's M-O-T-O-K-O. -O. Like, what? Like, you're seriously telling me that a Japanese woman with a Japanese daughter is going to write her daughter's name on her tombstone in fucking English? Are you kidding me with this? No, I'm not buying this. At all. So, that's Ghost in the Shell. You know, the potential was there. It was, not a whole lot maybe, but there was still some potential there, but completely wasted. And because of that, I don't really think there's any reason to spend your money to see this. If you're at all curious, I say wait for cable, because it's really not worth your money. As an adaptation, it sucks, but even just as a movie, it's just... okay. That's it. And that about wraps it up for Ghost in the Shell 2017. Till next time, take care.